I'm going to assume you can see it unless you text me. You all know how to text me anyway, so that is fine. Um, so we're sharing your screen, Dr. Batcha. And I want everyone to know that Dr. Batcha is, I, I would say, is it fair to say you're the one who thought of this whole idea? What do you think? I think that's a fair assessment. So it's Dr. Batcha's brainchild of how do we pull in rare disease researchers and give them a program to help equip them to be more successful. So that's why every year I ask Dr. Batcha to join us and talk to us about what's made him successful, and kind of what is your hope for how to help the next generation to stay successful in rare disease to keep this legacy of rare disease research going. So I think that if any of you ever run into Mark Batcha at a meeting, you should walk up to him and say hi. This is one of the most generous, kind, caring people you'll meet, both in clinic and in personal life. So I'm just going to throw it out there. If you ever see Mark Batcha, you should walk up to him and say hi and talk to him and get some input from him if you ever see him. If any of you are going to be at PAS this year, find me, find Dr. Batcha, and we'll all hang out and have a drink sometime. How's that sound? We'll have fun. Sounds great. So I'm going to let you get started. We are recording um, for those of you who aren't able to be um, in real time. Some of you sent some questions. We'll go through some of your questions. As always, feel free to text me or email me during the talk, and I'll share those questions at the end or you can use the online and post a question. I'll post those at the end as well. So Dr. Batra, as always, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us, and I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Um, well, welcome, all, all of you. Uh, and uh, I thought that I would maybe start uh, by um, uh, trying to answer some of the questions uh, that uh, were posed, and then I'll go into uh, discussing the, um, uh, the the actual talk I'm supposed to give to you about how to actually get a grant. But um, l let me start out with a question from uh, Deborah Singh, as she's the one who uh, uh, kind of uh, runs the whole thing. And uh, her question was, uh, uh, would you be willing to share um, uh, how you complete your writing projects? Um, well, let me start out by saying that uh, when I was at your stage, uh, I hated writing. Um, you know, I had just learned uh, to become a, a clinician, and uh, I started to feel comfortable doing that. But, you know, I had majored in English, and uh, I wasn't very good at, at writing. And I always keep with me the uh, very first uh, draft of the first uh, research article I ever wrote. And it is just horrible. Um, and um, uh, it reminds me of um, the importance of, uh, um, you know, how you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice is the answer. Uh, and so uh, one might, at your stage, uh, avoid writing because it, it may be difficult for some of you, um, and uh, especially if uh, your native language is not English, uh, writing in English um, in a style that, that's accessible may be, uh, may be uh, difficult. But I'll tell you that your ability to write uh, and rewrite uh, and to have your mentors uh, rewrite and redline everything is incredibly important because reviewers, be they reviewers for um, uh, for papers or reviewers uh, for your grants, uh, really appreciate a well-written article or grant. Uh, not just that its English is good, but the structure uh, makes sense. And so the only way you do that is by taking time. So even now, at, at my stage, every day I write. Um, it's sort of like practicing or going to the gym uh, or anything else that, that's important to you, um, you have to do it every day to continue to, to do it well. Uh, and uh, learning from your mistakes and gradually getting better and better. So whenever I'm uh, actually going after a grant, I will uh, start writing that grant uh, five to six months in, in advance of, uh, of actually submitting the grant. Uh, and if I'm writing a paper, I'll write, start writing it at least three months before I um, uh, before it's due. Um, and 
I make sure that I always get things in on time. Because if not, it just kind of uh, accumulates. And uh, the, the more delayed you are in doing one thing, uh, the, the higher your uh, pile grows. So it never gets better. So, uh, and, and it's just like thinking about writing the great American novel. If you think about it in that fashion, you'll never write it. But if you write it one chapter at a time and have a goal at the end of it, uh, then you can get through it. So, uh, which is a long-winded way of answering Deborah's question and saying that uh, I plan ahead, um, months in ahead, and I write every day. And then I, I, one of the advantages of, of writing so far in advance is that you can put it away for uh, a day or two or even a week and come back to it fresh. Because after you've been working on it for uh, uh, so, so long, um, you may think everything is perfect. And it's only when you step away that you can see the problems. Plus, if you get it done early, you can send it out uh, for a good review. If you send it to your mentor the day before it's due, you're not going to get very much. On the other hand, if you send it a couple of weeks in advance, they may find some things that can be very helpful to you in terms of uh, making the change. So, Deborah, does that answer? Yes, as always. Thank you. Um, Peter, um, uh, you asked a question, how have you prioritized patient care administrative responsibilities and research efforts? And uh, I would say that depends on what my job was at the time. So I've had um, uh, three, three jobs um, in my life. And, uh, and I um, uh, finished my fellowship, and I'm a developmental pediatrician, I'm not a geneticist. I finished my fellowship in 1975, uh, and I did that at uh, Johns Hopkins. And I stayed there for 15 years on uh, faculty. Uh, and then I spent 10 years at uh, CHOP. And then the last 20 years, I've been here at Children's National Medical Center. So in my uh, 15 years uh, at CHOP, um, my responsibilities were to be a clinician uh, and uh, to learn to be a researcher. So uh, if I looked at my time, uh, I spent it uh, probably about 30% uh, of my time clinically and 70% uh, of my time research-wise and did virtually uh, nothing uh, administratively. Um, I, I was uh, pretty clear on uh, what I was being paid to do and what my North Star was, what I wanted to become. And um, I uh, uh, simply learned to say no uh, early when I was invited to join uh, uh, this administrative responsibility or that administrative responsibility. Um, and uh, one of the other, Kimmy asked a question about, uh, you know, protected time, and especially when you have clinical responsibilities for patients who are very ill. Um, and, and uh, you know, even though you, you're supposed to be off, uh, you're, when your pa patients need you, uh, you're going to want to take care of them, and you're going to need to take care of them. So I had uh, two clinical hats. You know, I was trained to be a developmental pediatrician, and as a developmental pediatrician, you don't have, um, you don't have uh, urgent responsibilities. You basically are an outpatient doc, and you do consultations on children with various developmental disabilities. And so when I had that hat on, I, um, I was very uh, well able to segment my time uh, between uh, my clinical responsibilities and research responsibilities because I had a certain number of clinics a week. Uh, but then I, I made the mistake of uh, identifying a uh, young girl who turned out to have a urea cycle disorder. Uh, and over time, and this was uh, back in the 1970s, so that um, back then uh, things were a lot different, a lot less differentiated than, than now. You could have a developmental pediatrician who could elbow his way into uh, genetics without having uh, been trained as a geneticist or a metabolic specialist and simply bumble your way through. And, that's not the way it's done anymore. But what, that ha what happened was 
that I ended up being the only person at Hopkins who uh, knew how to care for children with urea cycle disorders. And because of the research that Saul Brussel and I were doing there, we were getting patients from all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. And these were really sick kids. And uh, so in one sense, uh, when I was caring for the children, I was also doing research. But in another sense, uh, you know, I was staying up all night uh, with uh, these kids in the intensive care unit trying to save their lives, and that clearly had an impact on uh, my research uh, productivity. But that's what it is to be a clinician scientist. So all I would say is that um, the best way is for you to be in a uh, large division where there are enough people uh, for coverage to be reasonable uh, and uh, that those individuals are well enough trained that they can, in fact, uh, cover for your patients uh, when you are supposed to be uh, doing research. And that, uh, secondly, that early in your career, you probably should uh, try and keep uh, your focus pretty exclusively on uh, clinical work and, and research. Now, what happened to me was that, and, and it's still the case, even 30, 40 years later, that uh, you get promoted administratively in an academic institution because of your academic prowess, not necessarily because of what you are as an administrator. And in fact, when I was recruited to CHOP, I was recruited to become physician in chief of Children's Seashore House, uh, which is the Child Development and Rehabilitation Institution affiliated with uh, CHOP and the University of Pennsylvania. And I had done no administration before, and then here I was now uh, head of a, of a small hospital. Uh, and uh, I learned, I, I took courses and things like that, but it, it was pure chance that I turned out to be reasonably good as an administrator. And uh, nowadays, uh, I think, again, uh, what you want to do if if you want to advance administratively in uh, uh, your your academic uh, situation, uh, you need to train for that, but you need to plan for it. And first, you need to become a clinician scientist because even now, it's really the clinician scientists who are being chosen for major uh, administrative responsibilities. So that's sort of my answer to the question of how do you divide your time? Nowadays, uh, I spend the vast majority of my time, I'm physician in chief of Children's National, which has an annual budget of $1.2 billion. So I spend 70% of my time as an administrator uh, now and spend much less of my time as a clinician and as, a, um, uh, as an investigator. Uh, but, you know, I'm also 72 years old now. So um, there's been uh, the, the beauty of uh, your career is that it can be very long. Uh, when I was at your stage, the average age of retirement was 62. Now it's 72, and frankly, I'm nowhere near thinking about retiring. By the time you are ready to retire, we'll probably be 82 years old. So many of you will have up to 50 years to accomplish what you want to accomplish, which means you can be many things during that time. So you don't have to do everything right now. And the thing that you need to do now is learn how to be uh, uh, clinician scientists, clinician educators, whatever it is your North Star is, is going to be. Um, uh, Kimberly asked the question, what's been the most successful strategy for funding um, uh, types of funding groups? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Yogi Berra had a lot of... Uh, a lot of funny savings, one of which was, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> and uh, uh, the idea of going in all different directions for funding actually is not a stupid idea because uh, NIH funding is, is pretty flat, and uh, I think one can't necessarily um, assume that that's going to uh, change over time. So foundations... Uh, you know, e each of you is engaged in a different group of rare diseases, each of which have their own foundations. Some of them have a lot of money. Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has $3 billion. 
Some of them have very few uh, uh, dollars uh, to give, but they have enthusiastic uh, families who can uh, uh, be promoters of you for uh, philanthropic gifts from uh, uh, individual uh, donors, uh, grateful patients, and grateful uh, grandparents uh, are another example. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are more and more now uh, supporting uh, junior faculty members. So the answer is to try and um, uh, diversify your portfolio. It's kind of uh, just like your own personal portfolio. You don't have all of your money in, in, uh, in gold or bitcoins uh, now. You, you have a savings account. You have stocks. You have your IRA. Uh, you have a house. Uh, and uh, uh, in, the, in the same way, uh, you want to diversify your uh, portfolio of grants. And uh, the beauty also is that you can repurpose uh, grants that you've written for different um, uh, organizations. Uh, and you can get uh, co-funding, if you will, for what you want to do. So the most important thing is having a good idea, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in, in just a little bit. And, and then uh, once you know that idea, uh, finding the right home for it. And um, that includes uh, going to the uh, NIH website and looking at RFAs and program announcements to see whether there is something that is uh, specific for you, to go to foundation websites, to just Google. Um, uh, all of you are in academic medical centers, and uh, so you're going to have a grants office. Uh, and a philanthropic office uh, that you ought to be able to go to with your keywords and have them go into the database and come out with uh, some opportunities. So I would, um, I would go after all of these different things. But the NIH grant still remains the gold standard. And uh, institutions, if you're interested in moving from one institution to another, are going to be interested in whether you have an NIH grant. It's the gold card uh, um, and a credit card for you. It brings indirect costs to the institution, uh, which is extremely helpful. I mean, our indirect cost rate uh, is 78.5% at Children's National. So for every $100,000 you bring in for your research uh, at Children's, um, I get another 78 thousand five hundred dollars to help run the research institute which makes you very happy so um, your um, uh, your your folks uh, your bosses are going to be very happy if you can bring in at least one NIH grant I, I should say of course that K awards only bring eight percent indirect costs in but uh, all of us administrators represent uh, understand that K awards are sort of the beginning of your career and that's that's just fine. Uh, for me, I started off, actually, with a Basil O'Connor starter, starter grant. Uh, this is from the March of Dimes, and they still focus a lot on birth defects, so that virtually all of you uh, should be uh, eligible for a Basil O'Connor Starter Award. And that's a substantial um, three-year uh, K-type award. And uh, the beauty of it is that uh, it can be used mostly for, um, uh, for supplies and technical support rather than uh, for your salary, whereas the NIHK awards are primarily for salary. So you can combine the two. Uh, and there are other uh, K awards uh, given out by uh, other societies and, and uh, uh, foundations. And you should look at the, com the possibility of a combination of a K award uh, from them as well as a K08 or a K23 award from the uh, NIH. So I went on from, uh, uh, I, after my first year uh, as a Basil O'Connor, I, I uh, wrote for uh, a K08 award and got that for five years. And then in the um, fourth year of, of that award, I uh, got a project within a program project grant. So um, in, in program project grants, which are uh, generally the pre PI is a very senior uh, level individual, uh, but uh, frequently the uh, 
PIs of uh, some of the projects or their co-principal investigators are more junior individuals, and I got one of three grants in a program project grant, which was equivalent uh, to an R01 in size, uh, but was easier to get, frankly. And then after, uh, after that, I got uh, a series of R01s, and then I got a series of program project grants that were my own, and then uh, U54 center grants. And so your, your career advances uh, from, from that uh, uh, perspective. And it, it's sort of like, uh, uh, in one sense, uh, becoming, uh, when you were in school, I'm sure all of you were very good students in school. And what you, what you find, uh, what I found, at least in, in high school, was that uh, after I got a reputation for being a good student, the, the teachers themselves would kind of cross my T's and dot my I's when I forgot to, to do it. They, they simply assumed that I had just forgotten to do that. Well, when you start off at the NIH, no one's going to cross your T's or dot your I's for you because they don't know who you are, and they, they're going to uh, look at you uh, from the perspective of someone who is starting off and is their idea uh, something that is doable and have they written in a uh, clear uh, fashion. And uh, so it takes a while until the reviewers start to get to know you uh, as, a, as a very strong investigator, and then they'll start giving you credit uh, for things you may have uh, just neglected to put in. To start off with, uh, that's, that's just not going to happen. Um, Irene asked the question, um, have your interactions with families or groups changed your approach for, to research? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, families are now um, uh, my collaborators in a way uh, that they weren't when I first started. Uh, you know, the 1970s, uh, uh, 40 years ago, was a time when we didn't even share uh, clinical notes with, with family members where um, uh, sometimes you didn't tell a child that they had cancer when they had cancer. Um, I, I mean, it's just, it's been an incredible and wonderful change in looking at patients as our collaborators now, especially in rare diseases. Your families are going to know far more about their child than, uh, than we are who, who see them uh, once a month or less often than that as opposed to the families who can understand all the subtleties of, uh, of their child's uh, disease because they live with it every day. And so not to listen to families, not only from a clinical perspective, but to listen to them uh, about their own ideas about research and what's important for them to do, uh, what they feel is important for us to do uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to make life better for them and their children. Uh, I think is tremendously important. Families also can be really helpful in, in help in fundraising, either uh, if they themselves ha have money or through the uh, foundations that they uh, form or through their uh, advocacy uh, through legislation. Um, they're incredible. And in fact, in our most recent Rare Disease Clinical Research Center grant, one of our principal investigators is the executive director of the National Urea Cycle Disorder Foundation. She is an extraordinarily bright woman. She doesn't have a PhD, but uh, she ha sure has a PhD in urea cycle disorders. And uh, she's been uh, an equal member of leadership uh, for our, our programs. So any way that you can involve uh, your, your parents and the families uh, in your research uh, as uh, not only participants, uh, but as idea generators and as collaborators um, is, is, can really uh, markedly enhance, enhance your, your program. The last question that I got uh, in writing uh, was um, uh, uh, from uh, Kimmy O, but I answered that, and that was about the uh, division of, uh, of responsibilities. So, uh, are they able to answer the ask questions yes, uh, orally? Yes, can I ask you another one? Yes, please. Okay. Um, this is from Sonia. What advice could be given regarding the overlap of aims, that is, since it's really hard to avoid overlap of aims between proposals if you're trying to combine funding, but scattering projects is somewhat self-defeating? 
Yes. So um, you are permitted once your your grant is is funded to uh, ask permission to uh, change um, a, a, a uh, one of your specific aims. Um, let's say you put in a grant for two hundred thousand dollars. Nowadays, it's quite common that the NIH will cut you by as much as twenty percent. Well, if you get cut, it's absolutely fair for you to uh, speak to your, uh, your scientific officer and say, uh, I would like to cut my uh, specific aim number four and seek funding elsewhere. And then you can, uh, you can have already uh, gotten the funding from the uh, other individual. Uh, the other thing is uh, you, may not, you may need uh, both sets of funding to, uh, to complete that specific aim. And the, the most important thing is that you're transparent about, uh, with the agency or the, uh, or the foundation about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So I wouldn't worry about the, the overlap, certainly at the time of submission, because you honestly don't know uh, what, uh, what's going to be funded and what's not, uh, and it's totally kosher to apply for both uh, um, grants. It's just what happens when you're fortunate enough to get both of them. And then it's uh, simply a question if you, in fact, need both, uh, both uh, amounts of money, uh, you just have to justify it, either because you didn't get all the money you needed from the NIH, so you also need the money from this other uh, program, or, um, uh, you know, or, or you're going to expand uh, with the additional money you're going to be able to expand uh, the aim. So transparency is all that's required in that regard. Other questions? I don't oh. have another one, so let's go for it. Okay. So um, let me, uh, in a sense, uh, follow up on uh, how to get a grant. And um, um, I went over my case history so I, I won't uh, go that further, but uh, there are certain principle, uh, basic principles to get any grant, uh, and you won't get a grant if you don't have a good idea, write the grant, obtain preliminary data, write up your data for publication, and choose an area where you're unique. You're unique. You know, you've already made the right decision by going into rare diseases, and uh, quite frankly, even though uh, my uh, entry into the rare disease field was purely serendipitous by my having uh, identified a, a child with a urea cycle disorder and then having uh, uh, figured out a new approach towards treating her. Um, but um, the reality is if you hit it where they ain't, uh, you're better off in being successful. If you're in the field of diabetes, you have to be awfully smart and awfully inventive to come up with something new. If, if, if you're in organic acidemia uh, research, uh, there aren't a lot of competitors for you. Also, you know, there's certainly more money in diabetes than there is in, in organic acidemias, but there are fewer people going after it. And uh, my view is that uh, having uh, chosen a, uh, a micro field, uh, your ability to come up with a unique idea uh, is is amplified because a lot of people haven't been thinking about it. Uh, so even the, in quotes, most straightforward ideas may be quite new. Um, so you have to have that good idea. Uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, trying to get money from a philanthropist. There has to be that wow factor. What are you going to do that's going to change the world or change your world? And then, of course, the second part, and we spoke a little about, it, about this earlier, is you have to write a persuasive grant. You have to tell a story. Um, what, what is it that you're trying to solve and how are you going to solve it? And because you're a junior investigator, the, the, uh, the people who are going to be reviewing your grant are going to be senior investigators and they know how hard research is. And so when you have 10 specific aims, they're just going to toss your thing aside, they know that you're not going to be able to achieve more than three specific aims. So um, be very judicious in what it is you think 
and, and you uh, promise that you're going to do. Obtaining preliminary data. Now, you know, as a, uh, a junior investigator, you get away uh, with something, but you have to have a few publications in the field so that they know that, you're, uh, that you've done some work in the field or are doing some work, and it can be the work that you did as a fellow. Um, but um, what, what is it that credentials you? And, and when you're talking about a K award, it's half about you and your environment and half about your research idea. So you and your environment is, uh, uh, you know, uh, do you come from a very good school? Uh, that helps simply in that they know you're going to have the infrastructure and the course and the mentorship that you need. Uh, who is your mentor? Is it someone who's uh, been experienced and successful uh, in uh, dealing with other ind uh, individuals who had uh, K awards? Um, and how have you done? Where did you come from? And uh, what aptitude have you shown uh, up to this point? Uh, that's going to count for half in your, in your K award. Uh, and then, uh, so writing up at least some things for publication uh, become very important. Uh, so that's, that's the first step. So the second is to know what your new uniqueness is within the NIH architecture. And I'm, uh, I'm going to be speaking primarily about NIH grants because they are the most difficult to get uh, and uh, because all the other grants are so different, uh, the, the instructions are, that uh, I really um, couldn't tell you how to do each one of those individually. So there, is a, there are two new designations, one called a new investigator, designation one an early stage investigator, ESI. So the new investigator, and there's a, you know, a lot of similarities between them. The new investigator is an investigator who has not previously received substantial independent funding from the NIH. So um, this can be someone who's 60 years old and who's never had an NIH grant uh, before. So it's for anyone who has never had an NIH grant before. The early stage is for someone who's 10 years uh, or less uh, out uh, of their uh, training. And um, in both these cases, uh, you're scored just like everybody else is scored, uh, but they give you an extra number of points. So that if you got a, a 30 uh, uh, in the score, uh, they might up you to a 20 uh, with that. Or if they were only funding up to the 10th percentile for everyone else, uh, they might fund up to the 15th or 20th percentile for an early stage investigator or a new investigator. So it's, this is a, a formal uh, thing and you need to put it on the top of your grant. And you need to check if, if, it's, uh, if you're invited to, uh, by the way, K awards don't count towards this. So you can have a K award and then when you write for your R21 or R01, you would still be considered an early stage investigator or a new investigator, whichever direction you wanted to go in. Um, so uh, uh, be sure to take advantage of that. Um, chances of success. So uh, I always remind people that uh, in baseball, if you bat above 300, you land in yourself into the Hall of Fame. Uh, and that means that you, you uh, get out 70% of the time that you're going uh, up there. So don't get discouraged. The uh, chances of success at the NIH right now are even lower than that. They're about uh, 10 percent. So you have to assume that you're going to have to uh, apply a lot of times, and you should apply as, as the last uh, question uh, promoted, not just to the NIH. If you have a good idea and you've put it up, not just put it to the NIH, but to foundations and others at the same time. Complete your grant early so that you can get external reviews, as I uh, spoke of earlier, and contact your program officer uh, for the uh, RFA or the program announcements that you've gone after. Uh, they're there to be helpful to you because your success is their, is their success. So um, they're really not your judge and jury. Your judge and jury 
is um, uh, is really the the study section, which is your your peers or your older peers, shall I say, um, and um, you want to develop a relationship with them. The beauty of our being in D.C. is, you know, we can actually physically go out and meet with them. Uh, and uh, uh, but even when you're not there, you know, you can Skype with them or or just call them, and uh, they'll take interest in your career. And it's also a way of getting a feel. They they can't prejudge how your your grant is going to be reviewed, but they can tell you whether the institute is interested in the type of things that you're interested in and uh, uh, either encourage you or, or discourage you from submitting to the institute or to the RFA uh, and perhaps offer you advice about if not there, where should they actually uh, go to. It is really ideal if you can respond to an RFP, a request for proposal, or an RFA, request for application. As in these situations, uh, be they at the NIH or uh, in other programs, there's actually specific money assigned to it rather than you're going into the general uh, pool of funds. And, uh, you know, if there is an RFA specific for rare diseases, you're in particularly uh, good, good shape. And if you and uh, you know most of you are involved with one of the rare disease clinical research centers, and you should use uh, the mentorship that's available in your RDCRC uh, uh, to help you both in choosing where you're going to submit and in uh, having them review your grant and the rest. Because as a trainee, they get credit for your success. Program announcements are useful because they tell the Institute's area of interest, but there's no specific money assigned uh, to it. Um, and still, it's useful, for example, if rare diseases happen to be one of the areas of, of interest, uh, such as in uh, NCATS, as an example. So what do you do when you're not funded? Well, get some affection from your significant other. Remember that your mother always will love you. Have a stiff drink or some chocolate, depending on what you like. Sit down and respond to the critiques after a week or two. Give, give yourself time to grieve and then look at it and, and don't just say, uh, these folks, uh, uh, this is fake news, this wasn't uh, uh, correct. Um, it is true that sometimes uh, there will be factual errors in the review. And if that happens, it certainly is fair for you to go back and call that out. But in most cases, the critiques are, are pretty accurate, and you should take them uh, as mentorship and go back, write again, and go after it uh, again. And the, the reading the critiques with your mentor can be very helpful because they're like the critiques that you get back uh, from, the, um, uh, from articles that, that uh, you send in for peer review. Uh, they're rarely accepted the first go-round. They'll, they'll send it back and tell you what you need to do. But if you read it closely, you get a feel for whether they're writing you off or whether they're encouraging you to, repu uh, to uh, republish. And that's something, that, those subtleties are things that you may not recognize yet because you've just not had that much experience, but uh, your mentor will certainly be able to help you in that regard. And then resubmit. Don't lose your confidence. We need you. Uh, and, uh, and the NIH needs you uh, because uh, people like me are going to fade into the sunset, and we need you who are going to uh, take, take up the, the, uh, the sword and, and move forward and help all these uh, wonderful patients who need us. So preparing a grant. So you are the PI, so you're expected to write the grant, but use your mentors. Write, rewrite, rewrite, and don't have any ego in this. Uh, you want them to redline it and uh, to cross it out and, and things like that. And uh, you can, uh, may, maybe your mentors are like me, and uh, if you're nice to them, they may show you their first uh, paper and, and how marked up and how horrible it was. We've all been there. Identify collaborators and get letters of support. You can't simply say, uh, Dr. Smith is going to help me in this. Uh, unless there's a letter of support, they'll discount that. 
uh, get boilerplate in terms of institutional resources, although you don't get a whole lot of extra um, points for institutional resources, if they feel uh, that there aren't the resources necessary to support what you want to do, you'll get points taken away uh, or it could sink your entire grant. So make sure uh, it, it's in there. I, I said write, rewrite, rewrite. Remember, these reviewers can have to Muted. review up to 40 grants. And if they read a grant that's a pleasure to read, uh, subconsciously they're going to say, uh, you know, this, this uh, investigator has a good mind. He's put a, or she's put a good grant together, and you'll get extra points for that. On the other hand, if your grant is disjointed or was written at the last minute, they'll think that's the way you think about things, and uh, they'll discount you for that. Uh, include a timeline for completion of the study, especially for a junior investigator. You need to show them that you've been thoughtful about uh, how long it's going to take you to do each one of your specific aims and that you can actually do it uh, in the period of time that you've set it. And it's a good marker for yourself because you may go through this timeline and say, oh my gosh, I can't really do everything in this timeline that I'm saying I'm going to do. And if you recognize that, uh, then narrow your focus. If there are review criteria in the RFA, uh, read them very closely, not only when you start writing the grant, but when you're finished writing the grant. Uh, and if you have a little space at the end, it's lovely to be able to have a little section that shows how your grant responds perfectly to the review criteria. Um, this is taken from a, um, a book written by my uh, uh, colleague, Ed McCabe, McCabe and uh, his uh, wife, uh, Linda McCabe, and uh, they are the editors-in-chief of uh, MGN, Molecular Genetics and Metabolism. And uh, this is a terrific book on, uh, on academic uh, success. And uh, what, uh, what's shown here is the timeline. And whatever grant you're writing, you really, at your stage, should take five months to write it. And this kind of just goes through, and I'm not going to go through each one of these. Um, what the steps that you ought to consider taking and sort of the work plan for it. So this slide and the next slide uh, really kind of goes through how those five months can be taken uh, advantage of, especially in terms of, uh, uh, of the mentorship that you can achieve as part of it. Uh, and then the third slide really just talks about the transmission uh, letter, which is really just a letter that, that says, uh, here it is, this is how I've responded. If there's an RFA, how I've responded uh, to it, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, if you've been working with your program officer especially, make sure you send a copy uh, to them as well so they can follow it as it goes through the, uh, the program. So let's just briefly talk about uh, each of the uh, sections. So the specific aims, um, when, when you're being reviewed by any study section, uh, there may be as many as 15 people in the study section, but only two or three will have actually read your entire grant. All of them, though, will read your abstract and specific aims, so that those become very important because everyone has an equal vote uh, in, the, uh, in the end. Uh, and even though the reviewers will suggest uh, a, a number uh, uh, for, for the vote, uh, the, there, there is a range uh, that is permissible for, for each individual study section member to vote within. And you want them on your side uh, because even a very modest change in your, uh, uh, in your score can mark the difference between having to reapply uh, versus, versus uh, being funded. So uh, it really is the organizational structure of your grant. It's focused on your research objectives, uh, and it has to be hospital-driven uh, and testable. Um, it's, you're only given one page max for the session. And as I mentioned before, uh, I would only do uh, three specific aims at the most. Uh, if you're doing an R21, that's for an R01 or for 
a K award, both of which are five-year grants. For an R21, I wouldn't have more than two specific aims because you only get it for two or three years. And innovation is really key. If they don't see uh, that mark of innovation, uh, then uh, it's, it's not going to go well for you. Um, so uh, if you look in the uh, instructions, uh, the next section is the significance. So the significance section provides the rationale and the foundation for, uh, for your study. And it should be organized according to the specific aims that you develop. So you're really trying to develop a story. So here's what I want to do, this is why I want to do it, and then this is how I'm going to do it. And here you want to cite other people's work. Um, uh, and, and that work should be balanced. So you should tell what, um, uh, what supports what you're doing and what maybe doesn't support what you're doing. Because if, if you don't put in that one that doesn't support, you can be darn sure that one of the uh, uh, one of your reviewers is going to know about that study and is going to say, oh, this young person, uh, she just didn't think about that. And uh, that can make an enormous difference. So, um, uh, you know, do both sides and then show it should be balanced, but you need to show why in the end you think you're right. Um, so uh, the review of significance that's done uh, by the study section will include the following set questions. Uh, does the project address an important problem? Is there a strong scientific pre premise? Are the aims uh, of the project uh, going to have an impact on clinical practice? And uh, how will it change things in the field? Um, they'll also look and review specifically for innovation in the score. So does the application challenge to shift the current research or clinical practice? Are the concepts innovative in themselves? And is this a refinement or improvement or some new application of theoretical concepts? And any of these things are great. And thinking about these review criteria as you're writing the grant is very helpful. Not just looking at them after your grant is done, but as you're actually going through it. And then if you have preliminary results, it always helps. Now again, if you're doing an R21, there's not quite the requirement for that. When you're doing a K award, it's less so. Uh, but if you have it, flaunt it. Um, so demonstrate feasibility of research through your pilot data. It showcases your expertise. Remember to present the data clearly and acknowledge its limitations. Don't ever over emphasize something uh, that, that, uh, that you're not really sure about. Include figures and tables. Not only do they prevent you from having walls of text, which again are difficult uh, for the study section member to, to read, uh, but it also is a different, you're trying to teach. You're a teacher here as well as a scientist. You're trying to teach them something interesting uh, your, get them excited about your work. And figures and tables are one way of presenting things as well as presenting them by, by words. And use color uh, when needed uh, and not when, when it's not needed. The next is the approach, which is the, the, the actual method, method section. Uh, and this is, the, the, besides innovation, this is the most important thing. So uh, you've now had a great idea and they want uh, you to, to, to show them that you really know how you're going to approach the idea and how you're going to get uh, an answer one way or the other. Um, the worst thing that they, they really don't like to fund is something where there, there's not a yes or no answer, uh, where, where you've really spent all this money and you've got nothing out of it because you haven't been able to accrue enough patience or you didn't ask the question in, in a way that it could actually be answered. So. Uh, Statistics and study design are very important as a part of this, especially in clinical research. So um, your approach should be organized by the specific aims, present enough details to satisfy the reviewer, but remember you have page limitations. And they tell you how many pages should be in, the, in this approach section, and it is the uh, largest uh, section. 
Uh, discuss what you do if your hypothesis is not confirmed. So when you come to a, a brick wall, what are you going to do? How are you going to get uh, around it? Uh, and you have to be uh, like a, a developing an uh, axon and, uh, and re, uh, retract uh, your, uh, your axon and go around it uh, so that the neuron can get to where it needs to be eventually. And uh, don't detail, don't take space detailing standard methods, just provide a, a reference. Uh, um, and then remember about human subjects and minority. Th these areas, again, are not going to get you extra points, the human subjects and minority, but, um, and it really isn't reviewed until after the grant gets a fundable score. But your grant will be held up uh, if there are human subjects uh, issues uh, and if there are minority uh, issues. And these are some of the next uh, slide shows some of the review questions that the study section are asked about in a reviewing methodology. So they're basically asking, is the methodology well-reasoned and appropriate? Um, are potential problems I identified? Uh, if the project is early, uh, does it seem uh, feasible or risky? And have they uh, provided uh, the plans uh, needed uh, to address uh, relevant uh, biologic variables. So again, look at this, answer these questions to yourself um, when you're writing the grant, and make sure that the answers for these questions are within the grant details itself. Your writing style, neatness counts, spell check, grammar check, uh, and again, you're not going to do that if you're working up to the last minute uh, before submission. Uh, and that's also why you need to uh, spend the, the time. Try to teach the reviewer. Uh, they all may not be expert in your field, so you can't assume that. And the more excited they get about what you're doing, the better the score is. Avoid the walls of text, as I mentioned, by adding tables and, and figures. And uh, the, the font size, uh, they tell you what the least number is. I found that Arial 11 pitch is a particularly good font. Uh, to use. Um, uh, budgets, um, again, budgets are generally not looked at uh, a great deal by the study section. That's usually looked at uh, by the uh, program officer after the grant gets a, uh, a, um, a score. Um, but on the other hand, you need to make sure that you have in the budget what you need uh, to do the study. Of course, in K awards, there isn't any choice because uh, they tell you how much the budget is, and most R01s now are in packets of $250,000. So, and in your first R01, it's probably going to be $250,000, and for your R21, it's going to be $100,000 or $200,000. So, in, in most cases, the budgets are fairly straightforward because you know what your cap is uh, for them, and uh, uh, this page really just goes in to some uh, specifics of that. The uh, submission dates for the R01 you're probably aware of. There are three of them uh, a year. Uh, and uh, the review dates, though, are four to five uh, months later. So uh, you basically need to think about your grants as being pregnant. Uh, it takes nine months uh, from the time uh, that, that you uh, conceive the grant uh, because it takes that four to five months for the review and then it takes another uh, three months for it to go through council and to be approved and to, uh, uh, to be funded. Um, but you will get your score with, within a few days of that uh, grant, and you all have uh, ERA uh, logins because you need to have those to submit the grant. Uh, and uh, so you'll get your score, uh, but you won't get your critique for four to six uh, weeks. Um, and so you really can't start thinking about rewriting until you have that uh, critique. The council uh, it meets after uh, the board, as I mentioned, and this is usually a rubber stamp. However, the council is influenced uh, by the program officers. So that if you developed a strong relationship with your program officer and your, um, your grant is uh, on the ledge of being funded, your program officer can really make an enormous difference in council about moving your grant up so that it can be uh, funded. Uh, but it, that, they're not going to grant; they're not going to move up one 
that uh, the study section is not enthusiastic about. But when they're only funding 10 uh, 10 of grants, the the delta between someone who's at the 10th percentile and someone who's at the 20th percentile, they're both simply phenomenal grants. So these subtle uh, differences can really make uh, make a change. Uh, the grant review process, uh, how you get assigned to a study section is impacted by the keywords that are in your abstract, so that's really critical. Uh, you should try and find out in advance what your choices are for study sections, see who's on them, and who would be the most fair reviewer for you. Uh, if you get into a study section that you don't think is the right one, uh, you can appeal that uh, decision, explain why and suggest another study section, and in about half of the time, uh, they'll actually accommodate uh, you. Um, supplemental updates uh, nowadays are very few, uh, and it's really just when there's a mistake that can be corrected. So you don't have to worry so much about that. And uh, I mentioned about who you're writing for and the uh, pink sheet. And uh, the types of grants we've also spoken about uh, and um, uh, again, I think that the scenario that I went through with my own case history is one that I, I wish all of you uh, the, the same in your, in your future. Uh, there are these uh, URLs. If you're not already aware of, I would suggest that you um, get on the listservs uh, so that you can learn about RFAs as they, uh, come, uh, they come through. Uh, we have about uh, uh, two or three minutes for questions before we end it. Uh, so if uh, any of you have questions or uh, if um, uh, Deborah would like to make some uh, final comments or uh, perhaps uh, uh, amplify on some of the things I, uh, I said. Walk it over. Hold on. So thank you so much, Dr. Martin. So I'm going to move your perfect. You're fine. So I just want to say um, I, I hope that this presentation along with the one that we had um, about a month ago looking at specifically the K awards is I think a nice combination of how to approach funding and how to think outside the box. And hopefully both of these lectures have made you a little less um, worried about taking that first jump and, and knowing that you deserve funding. Your work deserves to be funded and we just have to prove that to the funding agencies and that your work is important and should be funded because it's too important to our patients not to be funded. So hopefully this has been encouraging and fun. And as always, Dr. Batra, thank you so much for sharing your life with us today a little bit and for sharing with us. As always, you guys know how to call, text, all those fun things to get a hold of me. And so that everyone knows, um, we actually spend the month of February doing one-on-one -on -one conversations with each of you and me. So it's kind of checking in, seeing how things are going, finding any barriers you have to moving things forward. Uh, we learned quickly in this program that just spending half an hour chatting with me on the phone and catching me up um, can sometimes we can identify barriers and get you a way to get over that hurdle. Um, as you probably know, the whole RDCRN is in full support of you being successful. So we want to work with you to do that. So as always, thank you all for joining us today. This will be recorded and uploaded, and you'll have it uploaded in probably in the next day or two. So. If you ever need to go back and watch it again, you can, or we'll also put the PowerPoint slides on the website if you need to. Again, that's learnrd.com. You don't need to log in. You can just click on the link, and it'll take you right there. Thanks, everyone, and have a great afternoon.